Hello everyone and welcome back to cryptography. In this video I am going to be discussing hashing. So hashing works by taking some message, throwing it through a hash function, and producing some hash value. Now for example if we take lorem ipsum and uh, throw that into a hash function, so this arbitrarily large amount of data, we throw it into a hash function and out comes this specifically sized hash bit of data that it, when you throw it through the hash function always produces the same hash. It's, hashes through this hash function always produce the same size thing. And as we'll see here, if we just slightly change our hash data, the hash value dramatically changes. There's this avalanche effect. So if we change from lorem ipsum to morum ipsum, and we hash that, right, if we look back and forth, our two hashes are dramatically different. There's this avalanche effect in which everything just dramatically changes going through this hash function. Now there's another property, which is that this hash function is one way. So it's not like encryption where we need some capability of throwing our blob of data, encrypting it, getting some chaotic value as a result, and then being able to undo that or needing a key or something. We just straight take the data, throw it through the hash function, and out comes the hash value. And we don't need to be able to undo it. We don't need a key. We don't need anything like that. Any amount of data, straight into the hash function, out comes the hash value. Now there's a few properties that are super important for a cryptographic hash function, and it is the following. So we need a uh, pre-image resistance. So what does that mean? It means that given a hash value H, it should be difficult to find any input message M such that H equals hash of M. So I give you some hash value and I don't want you to, for example, be able to undo it, right? We said it's one way. And when we say that it's one way, we mean that not just that, oh, we don't intend for you to be able to undo it, no, we don't want you to be able to undo it at all. Like there should be no way, and not even just necessarily the original message, we don't want you to be able to find any message M. There should be nothing. And you can imagine that there could be this collision, right? Because we're working with this space of potentially massive amount of data being hashed and to this smaller value. So it makes sense that there's going to theoretically be tons of different values that are all gonna to hash to that. but we want it to be infeasible for you to find any of those messages that has the same hash value. It should not be possible. And we can achieve that by making sure that the hash value is a very large value still. And even though there are theoretically tons of things that hash to it, you're never gonna find one. So this is pre-image resistance. It's a critical property of a cryptographic hash function. So the next property is called second pre-image resistance. And what that means is that given an input message M1, it should be difficult to find a different input message M2 such that hash of M1 equals hash of M2. So given some message, I don't want you to be able to find another message that shares the hash. So not just given a hash finding the original message as is done with a pre-image resistance. Now, even given the message, you shouldn't be able to find another message where the hashes are colliding. There's a collision of the hashes. Okay, and then finally, we have what's called collision resistance. It should be difficult to find two different input messages, M1 and M2, such that hash of M1 equals hash of M2. So I'm not even concerned about my hash, you finding something that has the same hash, or even concerned about my message, finding a different message that has the same hash. Now, you shouldn't even be able to find two arbitrary random messages that share a hash. So in other words, with all of these properties, we can kind of think of some message and its hash sharing a very strong equivalence to them. So. The hash is just gonna be this kind of quasi random looking blob of data. But that random blob of data is deterministic from the original message. And due to all of these collision resistances and second pre-image resistance and pre-image resistance, we have this guarantee that basically my hash and my message are like linked. They're like equivalent to each other in some sense. And we can do a lot of cool stuff with that given that property where we can't find these other messages or these other hashes that kind of produce problems for us to kind of break this equivalency where we can find something else that is equivalent, right? We just have our message and our hash being equivalent. We can't break that equality. Okay.
So one of the uh, hashing functions that does uh, cryptographic hash is known as SHA-256. It's a very common one. There's a, a whole bunch of other uh, hashing functions, but one popular one is SHA-256. It's not super important to know how it works, similar to AES. It's not critical you understand, uh, other than to think of it as, you know, it's going to this mathematical blender, and for our purposes, we'll say that the, uh, the cryptographers have validated that those previous properties hold. Okay, so what are we going to use hashing for? There's a number of applications that we might use hashing for. Uh, one of them is called, or not called, but is password hashing. So we can imagine that we have um, some application where users must log in uh, to a log into that application and they provide their password. Well, it's not very cool, we'll say, to uh, store all of those passwords just as is in a database because if someone somehow compromises your system, they now have all of the passwords. And we don't want to be accidentally leaking passwords to the world. Obviously, we don't want our database to get compromised, but we want to be prepared for the worst case scenario. So a very popular technique is to hash the password. So we take their password in, um, we hash it, and then we store the hash of the password in the database. And we've said that there's this equivalency, and there's this like one-way equivalency, which means that if someone gets the hash of my password, they are not able to recover the original password. And furthermore, we can still do authentication because when I, on the server side, get your password coming into me, I can just hash it and say, are the hashes the same or not? So it's very common for applications to do what's called password hashing. Now, there's a solution, or not necessarily a solution, there's a, uh, a bit of a problem, which is that it actually turns out that you kind of can undo a password hash somewhat efficiently in some circumstances if the password is weak. So we might not be able to just go straight from a hash and uncover the original uh, piece of text that produced that hash, but we can just enumerate all of the most common passwords or just kind of sequentially go through a bunch of passwords, um, find the hashes for those values, and then build up this table where now we can undo password hashes that way. So this is kind of like a way of bypassing the fact that you're hashing passwords. Now there's a solution to that as well, and that's called password hashing with salt. So rather than just hash their password, we hash their password along with some sequence of random bytes. In this case, we're just doing uh, salt with a four, but really it should just be a bunch of random bytes. And we hash that, and what we store is their password as well as the salt, which means that you can't just have these efficiently already pre-computed tables with, uh, let's say, some hash corresponding to some password where we can now do a lookup on it. Um, now you would need to build these tables for every single particular salt, and kind of this makes it a lot more difficult to do um, password cracking, and it turns out that a lot of secure web applications, in fact, do this. They, they salt the password before they hash it. So that's one application of hashing. There is another application of hashing. So if you've heard of proof of work, which is a uh, important concept in, let's say, cryptocurrencies that work off of proof of work. Uh, and if you've heard of Bitcoin miners, let's say, well, it turns out what those miners are doing is that they're doing a proof of work. So what a proof of work is, is some challenge with some response hashed together and starting with some specific prefix. So that might sound a little complicated. What does that mean? Well, what that means is we get some challenge. Let's just say in this case, our challenge is just the string challenge, but more likely it would be a sequence of random bytes, but it could just be the word challenge is our challenge. And we need to find a hash where using that challenge as our prefix and appending some response, some random bit of data to the end, when hashed, it starts with a sequence of some specific prefix. So for example, we need to find four zeros in a row at the start of our hash. And what we need to do is we need to hash the prefix, which is the challenge, together with the response, which in this case is like, let's say zero, followed by one, followed by two, followed by three, right? We just need to enumerate perform all of these hashes until we find a hash 
that starts with our given prefix. So in this case, if we take SHA-256 and we hash challenge with zero, it starts with A5C5. If we take challenge one and hash it, it starts with A5C5 as well. Uh, no, that's not true. But we'll say that it is. It starts with some other hash. Apparently the hash here is wrong. It'll be updated in the future slides. Uh, but then we might also have, uh, as we keep walking, eventually we do find one that starts with four zero. So we find challenge 26387. We hash that, and that in fact does start with four zeros. So our, we did this proof of work. We got this challenge. We found our response. Our response is 26387. We send this back to the person giving us a challenge response, and we say, hey, the solution to your problem is 26387. If you take the hash of challenge followed by 26387, it starts with four zeros, it starts with that prefix. And we can make the difficulty of this proof of work arbitrarily complicated by increasing the, the length of the prefix, increasing the number of zeros you must find in a row. And because this hash function is one way, you're just gonna have to sit there and brute force these hashes in order to uh, find these values that start with the correct prefix. And in doing so, we've kind of guaranteed some amount of work must have been performed. We've kind of arbitrarily introduced this computational uh, delay into something by requiring this challenge response and requiring you to sit there, perform a bunch of math until you finally found a response to the challenge.